Hello, and welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center podcast. The HDI Act is one of the three Defense Technical Information Center basic centers of operation. These centers cover a wide variety of technical areas that are in importance to the Department of Defense. They provide users with focused expert technical consulting and unbiased scientific and technical information through an in-depth analysis and product creation. Today's podcast will discuss hazardous materials response. I'm Kerry O'Connell, the Senior Training Manager at Guardian Centers here in Perry, Georgia. And I'm joined by Mr. George Beatty, who's a professional firefighter and hazardous materials specialist with the FDNY, as well as an instructor for us here at Guardian Centers. George started out in the fire service as a volunteer in 1991 while he was in college. That led him to taking the test for the FDNY, which became a long and successful career in 1999. After 13 years as a firefighter, George transitioned to the FDNY's dedicated hazmat company, Hazmat One. He's been building on his hazmat knowledge ever since. George, first I'd like to thank you for joining us today. No it's good to have you here. It's I know you've be probably here. been here the past week training with us, so we appreciate that as well. Um, so first question I have for you, um, many people hear the word radiation and become nervous because they don't really understand what radiation is. Uh, being a part of the hazmat team in New York City, I know you deal with a lot of things including radiation. What kind of radiation responses or situations do you have to deal with? I think most people think about radiation and the first thing that comes to mind is what they see on The Simpsons where they think people are going to be glowing in the dark and uh, they <laughs> Absolutely, really, yeah. really don't understand how any of it works and uh, it creates a lot of fear. So um, the normal stuff we see in the city is as easy as anywhere that has a lot of granite, natural material that has naturally higher than background readings. Grand Central Station's a good one, Central Park's another one, where if you go in there with your meters, and we've done it on a regular basis to show new guys what happens, it's a, uh, you know, you need uh, to take a background wherever you're going to measure anything because the background varies. And you go, if I have to do something like that inside Grand Central Station, the numbers are going to be very different because you already have a higher level. Yeah. So it starts off with stuff like that. Um, the next one is going to be people. All right? We have uh, uh, people who take stress tests, who have radioactive material injected into their bodies. And if they walk past you while you're carrying your meter, you're going to have a, a spike in the readings. And I go back to a, a fun story that I've told a thousand times. Um, we were doing what we called hammer teams during the 2004 Republican National Convention. And we were basically patrolling the area around where the convention was going on to you know, keep an eye on things. And we carried a few things with us. And one of them was a, a regular dosimeter. It was called a Canberra. And it does, uh, it does dose. And it does dose rate. So my officer and I had uh, broken for lunch or to get a snack or something, I don't remember what it was, but we went into a Dunkin' Donuts and we walked through the door and took about two steps before the Canberra started alarming loudly, enough to cause the 25 people in the restaurant to turn around and all look at us. And we looked at each other and said, okay, somebody in here's got something. And we walk through the line and we're holding the meter out and as soon as we get next to one guy the thing spikes and he's looking at us with this, you know, uh -oh. what are you doing look on his face? <laughs> yeah. And we looked right at him and said, stress test? And he said, this morning, okay, that's it. It's, it, it's as simple as that sometimes. You know? And we've had people, you know, all people in the firehouse who've done the same thing and they come just to mess with us. You know, they're not working but they, they come and walk near the meters and everything goes crazy. And, that's a, a natural thing. Um, the other one is that we have uh, a couple of places. One of them isn't very far from, uh, from my firehouse in Queens. Uh, it was a place that did work during World War II. And the, some of the materials, let's say, weren't exactly disposed of properly back in those days. And they buried a lot of them in the ground. And unfortunately now, uh, they've been trying to get this one place, I think, designated as a Superfund site for a very long time. But if you take your metering devices into that neighborhood, uh, it, it's an industrial place, uh, you know, body shop, and there's a motorcycle place there, and, uh, whatever. Um, the, the sidewalks are not concrete. They're actually plate steel. And there's a lot of uh, shielding that's underneath them, but the, the readings are still very high naturally. So that's one where it's a, it's a background change, but it's actually a man-made background change, and they haven't done anything to, uh, to change it. 
there's also a site that's on Staten Island uh, that has the same the same issue, and where it usually comes up and bites people is in the summertime when they have brush fires. And then that takes the material and disperses it into the air, and then all of a sudden everybody's radiation meters start going off, and our guys start losing their minds sometimes. So, yeah. stuff like that. I know a lot of people have been hearing the term from him of background radiation. Can you just describe that? Because I think a lot of people, what they believe is they should get zero readings on a radiation detector everywhere they go. And if it goes up at all, then there's radiation around them, which could be harmful. So can you kind of describe what, when you talk about background um, and how it changes? Well, when we start teaching anybody about how their metering devices work, not everything is zero. Right. The first one, obviously, is an oxygen sensor. An oxygen sensor is going to show you that there's oxygen around you, so that one's naturally not zero. All right. We also carry a CO2 sensor that we use for other things. There is CO2 in the atmosphere, there's a lot of it, so that one is naturally not zero. And of course, the radiation meter is going to show what's called background, which is that there are natural types of radiation that are around us all the time. Everybody who goes out in the sun every day collects a certain amount of radiation that comes from sunlight and from what they call cosmic radiation that comes through the atmosphere from outer space. And everybody gets a certain amount of that every day, and it's naturally around you, so your meter is not naturally going to show zero. As a matter of fact, I'd be surprised if it never showed zero. Yeah. And what you do is you just start with that background, and once you know that, then if it starts kicking up, kicking up a lot, then we know, okay, there's, there's something going Taking your background is simply knowing where your starting point was, knowing where your zero is. So it's like a tear weight almost on a scale. Yeah. You know where you started. Okay. All right, uh, so most people know there are just some chemicals you buy in a store that you do not mix. Perfect example would be we, don't know, we know not to mix bleach and ammonia, or most people know that. What type of calls do you receive on issues like this? Um, and also, what kind of information can you give the people that are going to be watching this to help them understand kind of the do's and don'ts with all the household products that they have in their home? What's kind of funny is I think most people actually don't really think very much about that. Uh, one of the problems that we see very commonly in the city with, uh, with people who are mixing things they don't understand is when they have clock drains. They just start pouring stuff down the drain to see what it is that's going to dissolve what's in there. And yeah. That is probably the you, most common one. People go to Google and like, I have the worst drain ever. Like, what chemicals can I mix? And they're not reading what the source is from, and they're yeah. just going to see these two ingredients, and they're going to be very caustic or corrosive, and think it's the best way to do it. Right? Pour it down there. That one doesn't work. Pour this one down there. That one doesn't work. And now all of a sudden you have a bigger problem. Yeah. So, um, in that case. Realistically, the best tool they probably have is Google. And what can I not mix? What can I mix? And a lot of times, they're not looking at that ahead of time. They're simply looking to call 911. They don't want to call 911, but they're, they're going to call somebody else when they have not done their homework ahead of time. And things go bad, and all of a sudden, somebody's got vapors in their face from this mixture that they made that didn't work out all that well. And uh, you know, we get those calls not knowing what they were. Yeah. You know, we know that we have people who have symptoms. Um, it could be anything. You know, the information that we get is, is rarely actually what's going on. But at the end of the day, uh, we try to find out what containers they used because then we can go in and take a look at what they mixed together to know what to do. You know, we'll start with pHing whatever's left, if there's anything left in their, their tub, their sink, their toilet, you know, whatever it was and to see where are we starting from. And if we can find the containers, then we can see how much of it there was and what they put together so we can decide what to do from there. But like I said, in the, in the end, um, the best thing that they could do if they were to think about it ahead of time, which unfortunately most people don't seem to do, is to read the instructions on the can, use Google. Everybody has their smartphone. Everybody has the ability to do this. Sometimes they just don't think to do that until after the problem has come out of the box. All right, next question. So working in New York City, I'm assuming you get a lot more hazardous materials, hazmat calls, <laughs> than the majority of the United States does. Especially because, like we said, Hazmat 1 is serving pretty much all of New York City. So with that being on, on average, how many calls do you think that you would, your department responds to every year? It depends. Uh, I wouldn't assume anything about the number of runs that we do versus what anybody else does. 
Uh, I've never looked at any numbers like that, um, and, and I don't, I, I can't say one way or the other. I really tend to think that we do less than some other places do. I don't know why that is. I do think that the density of the city has something to do with it, right. but yeah. it's only my opinion. Um, as far as the types of poles we go on, the most common one are hydrocarbons, which is spilled gasoline, spilled kerosene, spilled diesel fuel, that sort of thing from, from wrecks and, and stuff like that. Uh, we do have uh, facilities that load fuels into vehicles. Those rarely have issues, but it happens occasionally. Um, the worst ones to deal with are probably the same as anybody else's. It's the unknowns. It's where you have to start from, I don't know anything about what we're going on until we get there. You know, truly an unknown isn't really entirely an unknown as soon as I have signs and symptoms or containers or things like that. So as long as I have a little bit of information, it's not truly an unknown. But uh, that's, that's going to be the toughest one where you have to start cutting down your unknown into smaller pieces uh, like we've talked to here, uh, talked to classes here about and what we've talked to uh, when we're teaching our own guys uh, or when we're teaching new guys that come into the company is, is that um, the, uh, the chief, he's going to want to know, what is it? And I'm going to tell him, we, are, we as, as our company are going to tell him, sometimes we don't know what it is. But a lot of times what we can tell them is we know what it isn't. And when you cut out some of the most dangerous things to pare it down to a class, instead of identifying a new classification uh, and say, well, it's not a radiation source, so we can take that out. It's not flammable, so we can take that out. And once we start paring it down to go, it's going to be in this class somewhere, it's going to be this sort of thing. Now, Chief doesn't want to hear you don't know what it is, but when you start telling him that or things that it isn't, now it kind of calms them down. You know, ruling some, things out. Yeah, ruling things out is, is sometimes, it doesn't start off well, right. but after you start to think about it, after you get the chief to calm <laughs> Calms down, his nerves, yep. that's it. Yeah. Now, because he just wants everybody, he wants his guys safe, he wants us safe, he wants the public safe, and once we, we know that we can say, all right, this isn't going to come and get anybody right now, it's going to stay in its container, or we've stopped it from going anywhere, that makes him feel better. So, what piece of equipment do you think is most underutilized by not just HAZMAT, but any team that responds that has detection equipment? It can be a submarine team on the, in the military, or just in general. What, what piece of gear do you think is, is most underutilized? That's a very difficult question to answer. We have two fire trucks that we take with us everywhere we go that are loaded with tools that we rarely use. I myself uh, am a, an enormous proponent of having the tools. Uh, I'm, I'm the one before, I'm, an, I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm a mechanic, I'm, I'm very big with, uh, with having the tools to do the job. My father started me when I was very little, uh, understanding that if you had the right tools, you could pretty much accomplish anything. Um, so maybe it's not underutilized so much as uh, you just don't have a need to use some of them very often at all. Having them there, trying to decide what is it that you have a good possibility of using versus which one is going to be the severe wing nut on the way outside that you might use once in 10 years. It's still going to be critical that you have that, but you've got to carry it around for that 10 years and make sure it works and it's functional and you know where it is and you guys get taught how to use it even if you don't use it very much. Um, one of the tools that I like that we don't use very much uh, are colorimetric tubes. Um, I take them out every once in a while, I go through everything and try to, to stay on top of, of the technique for it, but these days mostly with the electronic metering devices we don't use those very much anymore. Can you kind of tell uh, the viewers what color metrics is? The simplest color metrics that we use are pH paper and that simply is going to tell us if the, the, the environment that we're walking into is corrosive, whether it's basic or it's acidic. Uh, colorimetric tubes are a more highly advanced version of that that allows us to identify, further identify the, the vapors into something other than a classification of corrosive. Uh, and like I said, they're sealed in glass tubes and to use them, you actually have to cut the tubes open uh, and 
pull the atmosphere through the tube and watch the reaction and you have a, a card that shows you what the reaction looks like if it's positive for whatever that tube is designed for. Uh, I think they're very effective tools uh, and I think we don't use them very much. We just don't have a need for them um, or we don't, we don't really come across the, uh, uh, the materials where, where I am in New York um, where we really need to go and identify it. It's, you know, it's, it's truly very unknown. We tend to classify things, and, and if we can get it back in its container or mitigate it to the point where it's not a threat anymore, identifying it may not really be necessary. But that's how we do business in New York. You know, everybody's different. Uh, you know, there's plenty of things that we don't see that other places do. Uh, you know, I've had more than my share of people who have looked at us and said, "You're the top of the heap, and you guys know everything." And, you know, all this stuff goes down and you run 10 million calls a year in New York, and it's really not the case. Yeah. You know, I have something to learn from everyone who's in this business, from every different jurisdiction there is, because they're going to see things that I don't see, and I, you know, I'm going to see things that they don't see. And comparing notes there is, is probably the best thing to do, because everybody winds up with a bigger library to draw from, hopefully in their hazmat knowledge enable them, you know, to enable them to do their job better and go home at home. In closing, what do you see as the next threat to hazmat teams in large cities like New York City? Huh. Well, hazmat teams do a lot of different things. Um, when, we, when we talked to, uh, we talked to our, our, uh, our class this past week, we talked about the difference between something that is, that is an accident, which is hazmat, and then something that is done on purpose, right? And at the end of the day, uh, you know, the terrorist threat is is a hot button topic, and it has been since 9/11. In New York, um, the first World Trade Center bombing was uh, was in 1993, and that probably didn't ramp things up anywhere near as much as it did after 9/11. But um, trying to to keep guys minds focused on you know all the possibilities uh, you know New York is the is the most vertical city in the world uh, we have probably the most extensive subway system in the world there are two you know international airports that are enclosed within the city uh, there's a lot of moving parts and there's eight and a half million people at any given time the way I understand it um, so there are there are clandestine threats uh, you know, they're on the cover of the paper every day where you see people who, who build devices. Uh, you know, we had the, the guy who tried to bomb Times Square and we go to, to school out in, uh, in New Mexico. They, they, uh, they have replicas of the truck with the, with the bomb set up that didn't explode. I'm sure someone actually has the real truck, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's gone on all the time. But these days you have people who aren't even building devices. They're just driving a truck. And you could drive a truck down the street in New York City and mow down you know, people, and it's been done. It was done on the Lower West Side, um, you know, just like it was over in, in Europe. Um, and and that's, a, that's not us. That's, that's the, the uh, PD and Homeland Security and the Port Authority. Uh, you know, we all work together. But as far as the, the threats that Hazmat deals with, we train on a, a large number of things, whether they be uh, natural things that can happen from just the, the industry and the business that goes on, um, to going down and figuring out how how might somebody disseminate stuff in the subway, you know that's a constant. It's a it's an easy target, um, you know. And, and we come up with ideas about you know how can we outthink what bad guys are going to do. It's hard, uh, but it's a it's to a understand constant. how a bad guy operates. Yeah, you think like a bad guy. it's we do that here. We talk to the you know you and I talk to the classes about you know go home think about being the bad guy. What's the bad guy going to do? And we do that all the time. Uh, you know, we talk about the possibilities. You know, we have large-scale events like New Year's Eve. There's always a, a special section of people that are set aside from the fire department uh, to respond if somebody does something. Luckily, no one has. I think I think we text on uh, New, on New Year's Eve because I was like, oh, I wonder how George is doing because the. New Year's Eve party in New York, and you're like, don't go anywhere. It's just <laughs> the amount of people that says it takes hours to get people out of there. The foot traffic is incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. But the, the, just the density of people alone. 
And the, the NYPD and everybody else who are behind the scenes who are making sure that everybody's safe, though, they do an absolutely extraordinary job uh, of making sure that that goes off without a hitch. And it, it, it has got to be an incredible logistical nightmare. I was just thinking about the logistics. <laughs> whoever's in charge of those logistics, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, it's phenomenal because, I mean, they've really never had any incidents. I'm guessing security is, is absolutely phenomenal. As far as I know, and security is very tight. But we we've been involved with a lot of uh, a lot of events throughout the city that, that gather people everything from you know, from New Year's Eve to the Fourth of July to you know we go to the uh, the U.S. Open uh, in, in Flushing Meadows. Uh, but you know generally they, they try to put a contingent of us you know wherever something's going on. And the U.N. General Assembly is another big one where where they have a, you know components of all of the the different protective services to to make sure that everybody. You know, that it goes off without a hitch, and everybody's protected. And, and so far, I think there's a there's a certain amount of that that is calculated, and there's a certain amount of that that's just lucky. You know, uh, and at the end of the day, you try to cut down the lucky part and keep everybody else on top of their game, so that uh, you know we stay safe and we try to outthink the bad guys. And hopefully, that uh, that continues. And that's that's what uh, what we do here with uh, with. The guys that we teach here, and we try to uh, uh, to keep to maintain that uh, for our guys too, because that's what we're there for ultimately. Well, I have to say, George, it was a pleasure having to talk with you about this stuff. It's always good. I know it's a wormhole. We could probably sit here and talk for hours on it. Hours and days. And hopefully, uh, hopefully, we can. In the